Welcome everyone to panel one, uh, Queer and Conflict. This panel will discuss different ways in which conflict and queer can be thought together. We think about conflict broadly, being wary of confining conflict to already stigmatized and marginalized geographies. And we think about different conflict enabling structures such as neoliberalism, nationalism, colonialism, and authoritarianism, and how queer politics can make interventions into them. And of course, we're picking up here on the uh, fantastic keynote yesterday, which hopefully many of you were able to enjoy. And if not, it is um, available for streaming so you can catch up. I'm Jamie J. Hagan. I'm based at Queen's University Belfast. So I'm currently sitting in Belfast. I'm a lecturer in international relations and the founding co-director for the Center for Gender and Politics here. My research is at the intersection of thinking about women, peace and security and queer security studies. So it's very exciting to see this space for us to be having this conversation. I would like to go ahead and introduce our first speaker, um, who is someone who I'm just thrilled to be on a panel with here today. Debia Shannon is the head of department, the Department of Politics and International Relations at the University of Westminster. Uh, presenting uh, contemporary colonialisms and queering nationalisms. And I just wanted to highlight a little bit from um, his bio on his website where he writes, my ideas emerge as much on Facebook as it does in structured scholarly forums. I indulge in concepts as much in everyday politics. What has remained consistent so far is my desire to produce scholarship that is meaningful to groups and people who are often marginalized, minoritized, occupied, and suppressed. And with that, I'll go ahead and hand it over for our first presentation. Uh, thank you, Jamie, and thank you, everyone, for uh, having us here. And it's amazing. I was saying earlier before you all joined us is that it seems that queers are taking over the world. Well, that's a fantasy, but well, we should have fantasy because without fantasy, we would not survive in this world. Uh, but uh, this conference is amazing <clears throat> because it has brought us together. Some of us know each other, some of us didn't know each other, but that's what the conversation should be about. Now, in terms of, uh, I don't have any presentation, so I have some ideas which I noted down here yesterday. And this is always a challenge that when you give an abstract, you have all these ideas that you want to write a paper. And sometimes, or most of the time, you don't end up writing paper because you don't get time, but you have ideas. So I'll go through some of the ideas. It may not be always jointed, so it could be disjointed from time to time. So please let me do that. And of course, during question answer, I could explain certain things to you. Now, I'll start with the uh, keynote and also the work of the keynote speakers yesterday around Hindu, sorry, around particular homo nationalism, right? So What's the importance of critique of homo nationalism? It's largely around the fact that essentially it is a critique of the use of weaponization of certain LGBTQ identities in order to then support politics or actions that are not progressive, right? So use of progressive ideas for not so progressive purposes. What I have noted, and I'll start with this uh, caution is, what I've noted is a lot of time, I'm not saying particularly those who use, home, uh, or let's say Hindu nationalism, sorry, I say Hindu nationalism, that's one of my areas of work, but those who use homo nationalism, I'm talking of many of the scholars who have started using Puar's idea and even now um, Rahul Rao's idea in terms of uh, homo nationalism. The focus is more on the critique of the homo part than the nationalism part. What we forget, of course, is what this kind of critique has to be driven by and has been driven by is not necessarily a critique of certain strand of queer politics, but essentially driven by a certain skepticism of nationalist politics. Why do we need to critique that nationalism? We need to critique nationalism per se because nationalism are majoritarian, nationalism are exclusivist, nationalism are oppressive, they're exclusionary, they lead to self other dynamics, they are oppressive, violent, and colonial, right? So these are the reasons why I need to critique nationalism. And it's quite important to bear that in mind that when, as queer scholars, we are critiquing homo nationalism, we should not focus excessively on the homo part and forget the nationalist part. That's one uh, warning I would like to give to ourselves, right? Now, why, think of it, but why should we be surprised about homo nationalism, right? I mean, why should we be surprised that certain, and I'm using queer generally, right? Queer is a more generic term. Why should we be surprised that queer activists, queer people, queer academics sometimes may conform to certain ideas of nationalism? We are surprised because we have a certain assumption 
we hold on to. And that assumption is that queer is meant to be subversive. Queer is not meant to be one that will be used to exclude others, right? So it starts with a very positive view of what queer ought to be. And that is why we are aghast at or skeptical of or oppose homonationalism. So the two things, we have a notion of queer, which ought to be anti-exclusivist, so inclusionary some way or, and subversive. And we have to have a notion of nationalism, which recognizes how nationals are immensely oppressive and colonial. Now, the, so with all of that, I mean, the risk, and there is a risk with the use of, or the casual use of homo-nationalism or homo-capitalism in various ways. And I have noticed uh, through the, by looking at works of other people, even the ways in which it's dropped, that, oh, it's, it's um, homo-nationalist, it's homo-capitalist. The risk with that is it ignores the fact that much of this debate about homo-nationalism still remains in the West. Of course, we all, most of us are here in the West, not all of us, but many of us here in the West. It does indirectly or directly reinforce the idea that the LGBTQ rights are somehow part of neo-colonial agenda. They might be, but that's what it's reduced to. It does not, it also leads to, or rather it doesn't challenge enough those who look for more authentic queer selves in non-Western world or authentic self, non, not queer, authentic non-Western selves. And of course, in most cases, when you look at the, and uh, when we study nationalisms and nationalist identities in both Asia and Africa in particular, I'm not so much familiar with the Latin American context. In both Asia and Africa, the post-colonial subjectivity that's imagined is one that was quite glorious, then became weak, then was occupied, colonized, and now is re so reinforcing itself and coming back on world stage and needs to be very strong. So the idea of post-colonial subjectivity that fuels most of the post-colonial nationalisms is one that at its very heart is rather masculinist, of heterosexist kind. So even when they might not be run by heterosexual people, but the idea of subjectivity, the personal sub national subjectivity is a heterosexist masculinist subjectivity. And homo nationalist critique in general, or the use of it by many scholars, does not adequately focus attention on that. They're focused largely on how from the West, there's homo nationalism, and sometimes in Indian context, there's homo Hindu nationalism. Uh, by the way, maybe please correct me if I'm wrong. I haven't read much about uh, homo Chinese nationalism. I haven't read much about homo Turkish nationalism. I have not read much about other forms of nationalism. And one wonders why. Is it because it, they don't exist? If they don't exist, why don't they exist? Or is it that they exist, but there's not much research on that? Or is it that I'm ignorant? So I'm uh, more than happy to be corrected on this. But what critique of homo nationalism and even to an extent homo capitalism does, by the way, I was listening to homo uh, yesterday, Rahul and uh, Jaspira and others, think of, why do we not hear of homo communism or homo socialism? But anyway, again, that's the question. Now, in terms of what that critic ca can risk, and it risks reinforcing the idea of homosexual as foreign and alien in non-Western context. So my interest is actually less about what happens here. Yes, I'm interested, but although I live here, but I don't care. My focus is largely on, I mean, the abstract I've talked about India with the Kashmiris, China with the Uyghurs and uh, Tibetans, and uh, Turkey with the uh, Kurds. In all these contexts where, while we may like to believe that these states behave through Western idea or incorporate and inculcate Western ideas, and the West is not an alien subject for them, that's true. But the fact of the matter, these states are non-Western powers and they identify as non-Western, and they do act in defense of a certain nationalist identity that's partly, if not fully defined vis-a-vis -vis the West. In different ways, but it's defined vis-a-vis -vis the West. So at least we need to give agency to the nationalists in India, China, and Turkey, where they represent themselves as non-Western and even sometimes anti-Western. Not Let's not take away from them and not assume that all ills that happen are somehow Western and all they're doing is learning bad behavior from us, right? Now, what the critique of homo-nationalism often does is it ignores the queer phobia that lies at the very heart of the nationalist projects in these countries. And how these nationalist projects, of course, then manifest vis-a-vis, -vis, uh, particularly minorities, but also vis-a-vis -vis people they occupy. So I use Kurds, uh, Uyghurs, Tibetans, and Kashmiris as those who are occupied and not necessarily minoritized. Of course, from the nation state perspective, these are minority people. 
Even in case of Turkey in the past, they did not even recognize Kurds as a minority properly, right? But at least they're minoritized. And that's the most recognition they'll provide. We would argue that it's not, they're not minoritized people. They're actually occupied people. They're colonially occupied. So the, what we need to do, and in my own work, I'm quite keen on studying the nature of sovereign nations, sovereign, sovereign nation statehood that these countries manifest and the ways in which it's a mix of being a victim, but also asserting oneself. And this is very much connected to the idea that we are not anti-Western always, but sometimes anti-Western, but mostly non-Western. And all of that has at its very heart the idea of queer phobia. So queer phobia is fundamental to how these nation state projects are imagined. Now, even when, for instance, take an example of uh, homo Hindu nationalism in Indian context with the Kashmir, and some of you would have worked on it, some of you would be familiar with it. Let's not overplay the idea of homo Hindu nationalism in that context. For instance, you would not find usually um, Narendra Modi himself, or most scholars of, or not scholars, I don't, it's not good to call them scholars, most ideologues of RSS, the parent body, the Hindu fascist parent body of uh, the BJP, the right wing party, right? They would not indulge in what would be homo Hindu nationalism. It is often Savarna, the upper caste, dominant caste, gay men, and occasionally others who want to curry favors with the ruling regime, and they would indulge in what's homo Hindu nationalism. But the fact is, even without that homo Hindu nationalism, India was a colonial power. So actually having that homo Hindu nationalism doesn't help India in any case, because it was a brutal colonial power, even when India was not Hindu nationalist, when India was supposedly secular. So be it the, be it the right, or the left or the center in India, what unites most of the Indian political spectrum is the idea that Kashmir belongs to India, whether the Kashmir is like it or not. And therefore, Kash India is, in that sense, a legitimate power, which, of course, from my perspective and perspective of many Kashmiris and many other scholars, or some other scholars, not many other scholars, would be India's a colonial power. So, yes, homo Hindu nationalism is important, but not that important in terms of making India what it is vis a vis uh, Kashmir. Now, in terms of uh, how does this kind of queer phobic uh, Hindu, Hindu sorry, queer phobic homo national operate in case of Turkey, China, or India? The first and foremost is we are confident. We are straight. straight. When I say straight, I mean rigid straight, not straight straight, but that, that's also straight. That we are straight. We will secure ourselves. Any kind of alternative desire is somehow challenging our own identity, and therefore we must not allow for that. Right. So it is a very mix of secure insecurity, insecurity, insecurity. But the key aspect there is do not interfere in our own internal affairs, right? So it's about non-interference. It is about masculinity very clearly. It is about desire, desire for the other. But it is also about essentially disciplining the other. It's about demonizing the other and ultimately invisibilizing the other. Now, for those of us who have been queers or who are queers, but had to invisibilize ourselves because there was no legal recognition, or even when there was legal recognition, there was no social approval for us, or even when the social approval because of family reasons, cultural reasons, religious reasons, or whatever reason, personal reasons, we could not be very visible. We should understand this very clearly, what invisibilization does, right? As queer subjects, we know the ways in which we are not often, we don't choose to be invisible. We invisibilized by processes of the society and the state in most cases, right? Now, something similar happens with the we, what Kashmiris, Tibetans, we, Kurds, and uh, Uyghurs. They're forcibly invisibilized. So Kurds cannot be Kurds properly. So they would be seen as, okay, in the past mountain Turks or in the now part of the Turks, uh, Turkey, but they are seen as dangerous self. Kashmiris cannot, Kashmiri history, Kashmiri culture, Kashmiri sense of identity cannot be seen as visible until unless it's seen as part of the Indian subjectivity. Uyghurs cannot be seen as something different or Tibetans can't be seen as someone different from the Chinese nationalist project until unless they're seen as simply singing, dancing, happy people who are grateful to um, uh, the motherland and to Beijing. I say in all these cases, what we find, of course, is with the culture, with the people, with the difference, there's an invisibilization. But that invisibilization is also connected to the ways in which these states also disappear bodies that they don't like. I mean, I'm thinking also of contexts where children get disappeared or not children, or this whole concept around sometimes honor killing, sometimes not use of honor killing, but something similar to honor killing, where 
queer subjects are largely erased, invisibilized, forced to marry, uh, encouraged to you know, uh, pretend to be straight, be straight passing, and of course, sometimes completely disappeared through murder, through active encouragement and abetment of suicide. Right? And let's not forget that. So I was thinking of this image, I'll show it to you. Now, this image is off from Kashmir. Uh, this is Parveen Ahangar. She's, uh, I call her my Kashmiri mother. Some of you know, most of you may not. India practices enforced disappearance in Kashmir. More than eight to 10,000 people have been disappeared by Indian state. That's also a practice common to Turkey, uh, China, and many other countries. Now, the way I would say that in my own work, I'm quite keen on looking at the links between invisibilization of queer subjectivities and queer people, not only subjectivity, but also queer individuals from a heterosexual society and the way and what fuels it and what encourages it and what just is used to legitimize it. And also the ways in which, of course, the state disappears, people that it finds inconvenient. So the ways in which queers are inconvenient and subversive and embarrassing People who are colonized in these countries are also seen as embarrassing and those who should be therefore invisibilized and erased and domesticated, right? So coming back to this, I mean, what I would say, and I had said that I will not take full 20 minutes, but I'll aim to finish in next two to three minutes only so that I have only 16 minutes or 17 minutes is, okay, so what I have been arguing in my own work and some of you are familiar, most of you would not, because I've not written on it, it's our I speak about it so far is, how to go beyond this debate over queer, sorry, debate over homonationalism, debate over nationalism, debate over what's post-colonial subjectivity, and how to understand and recognize that colonial subjectivity and colonialism continues today. So in my own past work, uh, even uh, what I've published in articles, I've looked at the ways in which even Marxist theorists, right, those who are theorists of empire, almost never talk of China as an empire. The only ones who talk of China as an empire are either the right in US to an extent, or some on the left, including myself, but mostly Uyghurs and Tibetans and people of Hong Kong. And yet, most of the progressives in the West ignore them. So progressives in the West would be quite okay to talk about, of course, they will be fine in talking about Israeli occupation of uh, Palestinians. That's there. Turkish occupation, mm, not really, depends upon who you are. Indian occupation, okay, sometimes Chinese occupation, there's uh, silence. So one has to wonder what fuels and what inspires and what uh, is the politics of the progressive left even uh, in the Western context. But finally, what I would argue is what we need to do, of course, is go beyond critique of homonationalism to what I would call queer ethics of subversion. And what queer ethics of subversion is first and foremost recognizes that there is no a priority, uh, let's say, there's a struggle for Uyghurs, a struggle for Kashmiris or you know, Kurds or whatever. We cannot and must not allow this position that queer rights come later. Let's focus first on decolonizing. There is no genuine decolonization until unless we take, recognize that fight for freedom, fight for azadi, fight for independence, fight for subjectivity cannot be divorced from one or the other. So we can't talk of liberation of women and queers or whatever, but not talk of liberation of the territory and the entire population. And at the same time, we should not be excessively accepting of or tolerant of the claims for struggle for freedom, which not only don't challenge, but actively reinforce queer phobia and then present demand for queer rights or demand for women's rights or demand for you know, other minority rights as distraction from the main struggle. What we have learned from the 1950s, 60s supposed independence movements of various countries is that if you postpone the struggle for freedoms of minority, freedoms for women, freedom for LGBTQ now by now, right? For later that once the country gets independence, they, that, that, that struggle never comes to fruition. It's, it's quite important therefore that we practice what I would say, queer ethics of subversion, that the way in which the struggle for decolonization has to be continuous and perpetual, the struggle against queerophobia also has to be perpetual and continuous. We can't have one or the other. And therefore what I would end by saying is in all of this, let's also cut some slack here for people who identify as queers. There's no reason why we should expect queer embodied subjects to be the perfect intersectional people who'd always talk of the rights of the others as they talk of rights of, the, uh, of themselves when 
we don't expect the same standards from those who are talking the rights of their cultural, religious community or national identity, but without talking of rights for the queers. So it's quite important that as queers, we struggle, we, we, we work together, we focus on care, we focus on the fact that we have to survive. And it's quite important that queers have been erased historically, therefore we need to survive, but at the same time, we need to develop a new form of intersectional politics that's based on subversion, that's based on decolonization, and that's based on moving beyond critique of only one or the other, but that's based on the joint struggle of all. Thank you very much. Thank you for kicking us off with that um, really engaging, presentation and also this call for a queer ethics of subversion. I'd be really interested to hear um, once again to welcome everyone who's joined us and also please do uh, begin to ask questions in um, the chat because I certainly have questions and curiosities from our, our first speaker. Our second speaker is Evren Sachi, who's the assistant professor at Yale University, who will be pre presenting on neoliberalism, Islam, and securitization of queers. I did want to say that um, she's a scholar of transnational sexualities whose work is informed by feminist and queer theory an ethnographic methodology, which you can read in the recently published Queer and Translation, Sexual Politics Under Neoliberalism, Neoliberal Islam, uh, which was published by Duke University Press. Uh, so thank you. Go ahead and take, take us away. Thank you. Thank you, Jamie. Um, hi, everyone. It's a real pleasure to be here thinking about these urgent questions alongside you. So um, I want to quickly thank the organizers, Hakan and Marcin, as well as all the organizing units for bringing us together and Jamie for moderating us. Let me start with a snapshot of Turkey in 2021 so far, and um, it's not going to be pretty. On the first day of the year, a new president was appointed to Boğaziçi University, one of the long-standing public universities in the country, by a presidential decree. Since the appointment completely undermined the university structure based on faculty governance, which requires that presidents are elected by faculty and not appointed by the government, Students and faculty members have staged protests on campus, which were also joined by protests of alumni and others off campus. The on campus protests of faculty and students are on week 12 as of um, yesterday. A few days after the appointment and in the midst of ongoing protests, news spread about an art piece combining religious and queer symbols at a campus exhibit, which led to first complaints about disrespecting religion and quickly to the arrest of several students and the shutting down of the LGBTI plus club of the university. More students protested on campus, now also the arrests in addition to the appointment, and they were severely attacked by the police that was invited to campus by the newly government appointed president, um, because unlike in the US, police are not permitted on college campuses in Turkey without the invitation or permit of the president or a dean. We're going to return to the story a little later. On March 8th, the annual Women's March took place, which resulted in several trans women singling out and detention. Later that night, police raided the homes of many other protesters and detained them also. On March 17th, the pro-Kurdish party HDP's elected deputy and human rights advocate, Omar Faruk Gergerlioğlu, was stripped of his parliamentary seat and immunity and he was arrested two days later in the midst of his sit-in, live-in, sort of at the parliament building to protest this decision in the middle of performing ablution, getting ready for prayer. The government is also moving to close the entire party, the pro-Kurdish HDP, which I would say constitutes the most vocal and radical opposition to the government today. Also last Friday night, in the middle of the night, um, several presidential decrees were passed one withdrawing Turkey from the Istanbul Convention that pledges prevention and combat of domestic violence and violence against women. Um, one announcing the transfer of Gezi Park, among other important pieces of public property from municipal control to a national foundation under government control. Another one replacing the head of the central bank who had been appointed only four and a half months ago and yet another one, the organizing st state support for private development projects that eases the financing of the environmentally disastrous Istanbul Canal. And disastrous here is a bit of an understatement. In my book, Queer in Translation, Sexual Politics Under Neoliberal Islam, 
I discussed the ways in which the ways in which the AKP government has married an alleged Islamic morality with neoliberalism towards authoritarian ends. Following in Darpal Grewal, I suggest that if neoliberal capitalism is a system that produces increasing precarity for larger groups of people through the disappearance of the middle class, the rise of surplus existence, the disappearing of welfare and related social safety nets, rising dispossession and rising debt, and crushing of labor unions. And if it justifies such an equality via moralizing mechanisms, production of the categories of deserving versus undeserving, the rise of respectability politics, increasing individualization of responsibility, and emphasis on self-sufficiency and self-entrepreneurialism, then in the case of Turkey, Islamic morality factors as the key mechanism through which neoliberalism is domesticated and through which the government designates between the deserving and the undeserving, between the good moral citizens and the bad immoral elements conspiring with foreign powers for the government's downfall, and between those who will be targeted with securitization and those who will aid with it. Queer politics in particular emerge as a site where the effects of the existing regime of morality, as well as resistances to it become crystallized. Though I should quickly add that the marriage between neoliberalism and Islam is not an AKP invention, but dates back to the 1980 military coup in Turkey and the US investment at the time in spreading a liberal and moderate Islam in the Middle East in the context of both the Cold War and the Islamic Revolution in Iran in 1979. So I will tell you a little bit about the logic of neoliberal Islam and authoritarian security um, state in Turkey, and then we'll return to the question of securitization of LGBTI plus events. One of the particular ways in which neoliberalism and authoritarian securitization come together in Turkey is through the constant evocation of the robust Turkish economy as an object of international envy, you can laugh here, a target of, but it's, it's real, it's a real argument, a target of international lobbies and therefore as a reason for increased securitization. In other words, no theoretical maneuvering is needed to uncover the relationship between the economy that necessitates liberal freedoms and security that necessitates their curtailing. Um, this is beautifully outlined by Foucault, though Erdogan these days renders them quite superfluous. In President Erdogan's narratives, national loyalty and financial loyalty are evoked as one and the same, since national security is presented as continually under attack financially. The astronom astronomical foreign debt Turkey has accrued under various AKP governments is bracketed, and so is the shrinking of industry and national production on many fronts including agriculture and the increasing reliance on trade and import, as well as foreign investment. Thus, surrounded by various internal and external enemies, which President Erdogan has come to term the interest lobby, the Turkish economy requires all the safety it can muster and deserves all the securitization its safety requires. As a result, Turkey experienced securitization not instead of, but as an extension of neoliberalism. Since the national narrative produces the Turkish economy as strong yet under continuous international threat, the critique and resistance that result from actual precarities produced by neoliberalism are then delegitimized as the doing of ambiguous foreign powers conspiring against the Turkish economy and as its politics and performed by alcohol drinking, religion disrespecting, disloyal subjects. It is in this way Islam enters the framework of governmental narratives most significantly, that is, at the moment of taming dissent. Or to use the government's own words, when subjects refuse to submit um, biat ethnic to government's authority and sovereignty. Let me give a few examples here. For instance, in order to discredit the Gezi Park protesters in 2013, who were objecting to the neoliberal redevelopment projects of the government, that in that case would have turned the park into a shopping mall, Erdogan claimed that they had entered the Dolmabahce Mosque with shoes on and had drunk beer inside. This claim was quickly dismissed by the mosque's imam, who clarified that the protesters had turned the mosque into an emergency infirmary to treat those injured by police attacks. Yet it is impossible to miss the translation of dissent against neoliberal privatization into religious immorality in order to discredit it. Such discrediting is in line with Erdogan's polarization of the nation into pious, 
respectable, loyal citizens on one hand, and immoral, marginal, faithless traders on the other to consolidate his voter base. At other moments, Erdogan evoked the term putrat, Allah given nature, to quell protests of miners' deaths due to fire damp explosions. Explaining conditions of labor under neoliberal capitalism away with an alleged Islamic social order, he said in statements that it was in the fate, kadar, and in the Allah given nature, putrat, of mining that to have explosions and deaths like this. In other instances, Erdogan would lecture at feminists protesting his call for every family to have three children in order to contribute to Turkey's strong, strong economy, that motherhood was in the putrat of womanhood. Citizens' economic duties would also take the form of exchanging their foreign currencies, especially US dollars and euros, or refusing to invest in them during periods of devaluation of Turkish lira. Such behavior that goes against all tenets of neoliberal, or for that matter, any kind of liberal rational action, might seem to contradict neoliberalism itself. But let us not forget a couple of things here. Firstly, this demand follows directly from the logic of market prediction. The AKP, the government cannot fail, thus the economy cannot fail, and vice versa. Therefore, the robust economy needs to be put back on track at whatever cost a mechanism we might call a neoliberal state of exception. Secondly, invitations to invest in the national currency were always accompanied by rampant privatization of any and all public resources. In other words, citizens were responsibilized to save the national economy in a nation where everything was continually denationalized. Indar Pongrawal has argued that responsibilized American citizens under late neoliberalism are invited to participate in Christian humanitarian rescue projects as well as in national security. While Grewal carefully points out that her discussion of exceptional citizens is specific to the US context, neoliberalism is indeed breeding security regimes all over the world, since states are facing the challenge of containing increasing desperation, demands, and revolts. Turkish citizens, too, find themselves as responsibilized national subjects to economically save the nation, both through their reproductive labor and through such economic behaviors as investing in Turkish currency. When they do not comply with government mandates regarding their pro proper reproductive, productive, economic, or otherwise behavior, they are deemed faithless, immoral betrayers of the nation, national economy and national sovereignty. Queer events, gatherings, marches, and protests have also experienced this securitization, as I mentioned. When the first ban and police crackdown on the LGBTI plus pride march happened in 2015, and the ban of the trans pride march joined it in the following year. The government explicitly cited that the marches coincided with Ramadan and therefore provoked the public's religious sensibilities. Needless to say, there are many pious Muslims in the country who depart from the government's definition of Islamic morality, in some cases even radically so. Yet AKP narratives regarding religious sensibilities and public order nevertheless hail subjects into a particular ideological alignment with government-sanctioned Islam, which is first and foremost Sunni and nationalist. Following the coup attempt in 2016, References to religion were replaced by, a blanket, by blanket references to concerns about public security when banning LGBTI plus marches and events, including concerns for the safety of those who would attend the march, as well as the security of the tourists in the area. And, and this time it was not only marches and protests that were banned, but also film screenings, performances, art shows, and panels. Any and all areas of bodies gathering in any capacity now was understood as a threat to public security, especially if they were organized under LGBTI+. In the recent events leading up to the closure of Boazic University's LGBTI plus club and its aftermath, we see a particular return of the narrative of religious sensibilities and the suturing of religion to security and terrorism. As I mentioned at the beginning of the talk, as the protests of the appointed president continued, news spread about an art piece at a campus exhibit that was put together as part of the protests. The piece is a wall carpet depicting the Kaabe, the holy place for Muslims to face when praying and to visit during Hajj. 
The figure of Shah Shahmeran was superimposed on the image, and variations of the rainbow flag adorned each corner of the graphic. Shahmeran is a pre-Islamic mythical figure that is half woman, half snake, who is believed to cure illness, provide long life, and impart wisdom in both Turkish and Kurdish language folk tales, as well as in Persian. The allegations brought against a group of Boazici students cite both the sinful nature of homosexuality according to Islam, as well as Shahmeran's contradiction with the belief in Allah as the sole creator in Islam. While the initial complaints were made by the Islamic Research Club of the university because they felt the image disrespected Islam, ultimately security forces staged a bust of the LGBTI plus club and confiscated rainbow flags as proofs of ties to terrorism. Several students were arrested. Um, some of them have been released, released since then. Some were put under house arrest and almost all were banned from leaving the country. The question, are you a member of LGBTI plus? Asked of students during interrogations formulated in the same way of, are you a member of a terrorist organization? Seems to recognize queerness as political, as anti-governmental and as terroristic. The ways in which religious sensibilities and security and terrorism collide so seamlessly today speaks to the particular morality regime crafted under neoliberal Islam. Wazija students have worked diligently to produce counter narratives, underlining that they were standing up for LGBTI students today exactly the way they have protested alongside pious female students demanding the right to wear the headscarf at public universities in the late 90s. They prepared statements and videos for circulation emphasizing the coexistence of pious and secular students on campus, each group featuring some who found the artwork disturbing or offensive and others who didn't, and none of whom wanted the state or the police to be involved in a conversation they were happy to have amongst themselves. Yet these interventions are having a difficult time piercing through AKP authoritarianism that, among other things, continues its work to monopolize the meanings and symbols of Islam, of piety, of morality, and of social coexistence. Here are a few things I suggest we take away from this brief tale of neoliberal Islam's morality regime. For one, there's an invitation here to rethink submission as an Islamic value, as it is being evoked by governments in Muslim majority countries to tame the public and repress dissent and to divide publics into morally applied and morally questionable subjects. And this is a point also made by Paul Omar in the case of Egypt. There is also an invitation not to reify or culturalize Islam. I worry that this can be an unintended consequence of foregrounding secularity as the key modality of modernity in discussions of Islam and specifically of queerness and Islam, which erases its complex implications with neoliberal capitalism. This extends our discussions of neoliberalism because Muslims, in quotes, are inevitably not just the victims of neoliberalism, since neoliberal queer life seeks protections from alleged Islamic homophobia in the West, but also its subjects and perpetrators. In addition, statements by the government regarding the banning of marches and gatherings because they could incite one fraction of the public towards hatred and animosity against another, illustrates a regime not predicated on tolerance as governmentality, as Wendy Brown so persuasively argued of statecraft, but one predicated on preempting the potential social failure of tolerance as providing public security. I find queer and feminist protests that have been taking place in Turkey extremely promising as they refuse to think recognition without redistribution. They also refuse to fall back onto the old staunch authoritarian secularism of Turkey that has played a significant role in delivering today's AKP regime, a la return of the repressed, as they struggle to wrench definitions of Islam of feminism and of queerness from governmental monopoly. And one final note, I'm aware that conversations about the authoritarianism of a moderate Islamist party and its deployment of homophobia as a key part of its authoritarian political project to solidify its power are difficult to have during a time that simultaneously also showcases Islamophobia and homonationalism, as Jasbir Poir has so eloquently illustrated. But the world is a mess, as we all know, and this mess asks of us that we attend to its various coeval and transnational queer times unfolding everywhere. Thank you.
Thank you for uh, that second of our three presentations and thinking through the complexities of um, neoliberal Islam and the ways that we're seeing the interse intersections here between uh, securitizing regimes and around the globe. And for our third speaker, we have Lukas Schultz, who is lecturer at the University of Sheffield, and will be speaking about uncanny Europe and protective Europeanism, Polish queers in the UK in times of growing authoritarianisms. His work is dedicated to cultural and critical media studies, which investigate the role of media in everyday life. He's been particularly interested in the intersections of queer, national, and transnational identities in the context of globalization and digital media. Hi everyone, uh, thank you very much for coming and thank you to the organizers, Marcin and Hakan. It's a wonderful event. So I actually have a couple of slides. So let's me try to share them with you right now. Okay, so yes, so today in my talk, I would like to focus on the idea of Europe and I will zoom in on um, Polish queers in the UK and their European imaginations and identifications. So the starting point for my um, talk and for this paper is what the point that a lot of other um, authors has, have already made, that Europe has been uh, in recent decades reimagined as rainbow Europe. So Europe has been reimagining itself as exceptionally progressive in relations to gender and sexual liberation, uh, including exceptionally LGBTQ uh, friendly. Uh, and here we have a lot of different examples of that. Uh, we can see it at the level of European institutions, for example, European Union, uh, which started to include LGBTQ related um, issues as accession criteria or for example, introduce the asylum rights based on sexual orientation and gender identity. We can also observe it and the kind of level of international politics with some politicians, for example, in Russia are talking about gay Europa or Euro Sodom. So we can see, I think that's quite interesting that this discourse, it's not only employed by people who are actually pro LGBTQ rights, but also people who are against LGBTQ rights, even if they don't agree or like they're against LGBTQ rights, they still recognize that there is something queer, there's something LGBTQ friendly about Europe. Uh, and finally, also the level of popular culture, for example, Eurovision, which is a larger uh, song contest in Europe, which is uh, dubbed as the Gay Olympics. So that's the idea that Europe is being considered as rainbow Europe. However, it's not just that, that this idea is being used uh, instrumentally to create external sexual others. Uh, so here you can probably see that it works quite similarly to homonationalism, but at the European level. And indeed some scholars, for example, Francesca Maturro, but also some other scholars started to call it European homonationalism. Uh, so basically reimagining yourself as LGBTQ friendly and using that as pointing the finger at some other groups of people at some other geopolitical locations as not being LGBTQ friendly. And here, of course, those people who are deemed not being European. Uh, people who are located outside of Europe, so who are, I think, primarily the, um, uh, located in that discourse um, outside of Europe, uh, who are not considered European at all. And of course, those people are most often racialized. So there's non-white people, non-Christian people. I think Christianity and, and whiteness uh, are quite significant for this kind of discussions about uh, Europeanness. However, this, this, this discourse, it's also being used to create internal sexual others. Because when we actually think about the idea of rainbow Europe, well, a lot of central, uh, eastern, southern Euro European countries does, do not actually fit within that uh, narrative because they are still building their national projects based on the exclusion rather than inclusion of LGBTQs. So when we actually think about 
Rainbow Europe, most often what is meant by that in the discourse is Western Europe or Western and Northern Europe. Uh, so that discourse I'm arguing is also used to create internal sexual others, those located at Europe's peripheries. And here I argue that especially Central Eastern Europe is uh, viewed as different in time rather than as external sexual others different in space. What I mean by that is that well, some of the Eastern Europeans are considered most often as sharing some kind of common denominator of whiteness and Christianity. However, they are lagging behind the Western West because of the state socialist past. So they're kind of considered as not European yet, lagging behind in transition, which was discussed at length by um, Robert Kulpa and um, Joanna Mzielinska in their book, Decentric Sexualities. So that's, that's the kind of starting point for my discussion. However, those discussions that I've just presented are very often at the level of discourse, at the level of human rights discourse, political discourse, discourse at the uh, level of popular culture. And I'm interested here in my project, what actually people do with that in their everyday lives. So I'm interested in the so-called ordinary people. Do they imagine Europe the same way? Do they identify as European? Uh, and if they identify or not as European, do they mobilize those imaginations of queer uh, rainbow Europe uh, in their identifications and imaginations of Europe? And this paper is part of a larger project that I conducted with Polish LGBTQs in the UK. And I started with some online surveys and then I had 30 in-depth interviews. Uh, and here in that paper, I focus specifically on the European imaginations and identifications. I must say that at the very beginning, that was not my focus. I focused more on national identity. But then when I start talking to people about that and about Brexit, for example, they came up themselves with their, like, well, I actually more identify as European. So then uh, that was during the first five interviews. So then all the other interviewees, I ask them explicitly the questions such as, do you identify as European? Why? Why not? Uh, what does Europe mean to you? And what kind of associations do you have uh, with Europe? And you can find the research report from that project online. It's called Queer Hashtag Pulse in UK. Uh, what I also would like to emphasize before I move on to discuss the results is that I conducted those interviews, as you could see here, 2018, 2019, which is a particular uh, political context. Uh, in Poland in 2015, a conservative and nationalist law and justice party won the parliamentary elections, uh, which also translated in much more, much more and much more explicit anti-LGBTQ discrimination and discourse in Poland. And in 2016, of course, we had also Brexit referendum in the UK, uh, which also uh, resulted in growing xenophobia and racism in the UK. Um, and there is some research about that. So in a way, with my participants, I think there was quite interesting positioning, kind of geopolitical positioning uh, of them as being, on the one hand, less welcome in Poland as LGBTQs, and also less welcome in the UK as migrants from Central Eastern, Europe, uh, Central Eastern Europe. So I think that may be some kind of explanation why Europe or Europeanness uh, kind of work as a possible viable alternative uh, to kind of this major national identifications. So let's move on to my, this, uh, to my results. So first, imaginations of Europe. The majority of my um, participants has a very positive imaginations of Europe. So almost everyone was saying, saying something good and something positive, imagining Europe in a very positive terms. And indeed it was imagined in terms of rainbow Europe. So people were most often uh, associated such values as diversity, openness and unity with the European, uh, with the, you, uh, Europe in general. Sometimes it was narrowed down to the European Union. So some of my participants were emphasizing the idea that in Europe there are different people, there are different languages, uh, different cuisines. Uh, they also mentioned cultural openness, uh, including sexual openness. 
<laughs> in one sentence, actually one person did it. So I think that's very nicely shows how this kind of openness also translates into re rainbow Europe. So specifically into issues related to gender and sexuality and unity was, was also discussed in terms of no internal borders. And so here's one example. When I ask somebody, <clears throat> sorry, what they, uh, what they associate Europe with, they said diversity, acceptance, living your life uh, in your own way, being pro-ecological, pro-civil society. These are the West European and North European ideals. So I think you, uh, you can um, see here how those ideas of <clears throat> rainbow, but also liberal kind of progressive Europe, modern Europe, were very clearly associated explicitly in that quote with specifically Western Europe and Northern Europe. So at the same time, I thought it was very interesting that my participants who actually come from Poland, from Eastern Europe, so not actually the Europe that they identify as this kind of modern progressive Europe, that they show, um, they, they were talking about this kind of very positive association with Europe and Europe as something very desirable. And I use the concept of uncanny Europe to make sense of that, which for me means ambivalent imaginations and attachment. Europe that feels both familiar and alien, something that we desire, something that we identify, identify with, but also recognizing that this is mostly Western Europe, not our Central Eastern European Europe. And here I'm building on the work of the Polish uh, literary scholar Maria Janion, who came up with the idea of Niesamowita Słowiańszczyzna, which basically means uncanny Slavdom. And I use that to talk about uncanny Europe. But basically what she meant by that, it was this kind of strangely fam familiar uh, feeling of something being, of being associated with something, but not actually being part of that. And here I have one more quote when I ask somebody, do you identify as European? Well, it depends if you talk about Western or Eastern Europe. I'd really like Poland not to be in Eastern Europe, you know, that it walked toward Central Western Europe, that border was moved. I think it's very interesting because it shows uh, those kind of um, uh, positions, uh, Central Eastern Europe at the peripheries as something negative associated with more um, uh, homophobia with something closed and Europeanness as something that should be impressed on Poland and that would be good uh, allegedly for Poland. Uh, and now I'll move on to discuss the identifications, European identifications of, um, of my participants. So you could see that most of my participants have had very positive imaginations of Europe, Europe that is also imagined as rainbow Europe, and mostly defined as Western Europe. At the same time, most of my participants very much readily identify as European uh, when, when asked about it. Some of them about three or four spontaneously identified as European even without me asking them about it. But all the others, when I asked them about it, they said, yes, they do identify as European. And that was to a different extent. Sometimes they said like Polish and European. Sometimes, sometimes they were saying I'm more European than Polish. Sometimes they said it's like different registers, so it's actually you cannot compare them, but they feel both Polish and European. Um, uh, and then they employed those kind of rainbow, um, rainbow uh, Europe imaginations in those identifications as well. So here there's also one quote uh, from a participant who said, uh, culinarily, I'm absolutely Polish. Mentally, I'm European where Europe, uh, when later on I asked him also what he identified Europe with, and he said, Europe is a system created by Western Europeans, a system of democracy, tolerance, and a certain way of treating freedom. So I think it also shows us how my participants also identified with those values that they associated with, especially Western Europe, and kind of by saying that they, some of them at least, mentally identify as, or mentally are, are European, kind of reestablish their own Westernness uh, in that sense. And what is also important in that, um, in that paper is that those feelings of being European intensified in the context of the Law and Justice Party election win in Poland and in the context of Brexit. So one of the participants, Alex, said that, uh, that they were called fucking European twice in London around the time of the referendum. And then they continued. 
uh, the European identity is more active for me now than in the past. I realize that something is being taken away from me. Even if I don't identify as European, even if I don't want to, I'm being identified as European now in this political climate. So I'm exploring this identity. So I think that also points to the um, importance of those critical political events that Europe is imagined as rainbow Europe. I think it's a kind of um, prerequisite. It's, it's been there for such a long time. A lot of institutions are invested in creating that kind of image. Uh, and now those kind of events that alienate some of my participants um, from dominant or most relevant to them national identities, it's kind of make it easier to fall for Europe. But then my question was also, so what about the European others? If the Europe is imagined as so progressive, as so liberal and, and modern, where's the place for this um, uh, racialized others who are usually excluded from those um, imaginations? And a few of my participants explicitly uh, recreated the discourses of European external others. Uh, and they were talking about the so-called Islamization of Europe. So Michal, for example, preferred to date Europeans, uh, or at least people who grew up in Europe, to quote Muslims and Asians, considering the former as most more modern and more open than the latter. And another participant, Stanislav, recalled a situation when he was refused medical treatment in a hospital, which he believed happened because he was gay and atheist, and he believed that the doctor was, was Muslim. However, I must say that that was the minority of my uh, participants. Two of them actually only explicitly mentioned the Islamization of the Europe. However, quite some many uh, also kind of reproduced that at maybe a little bit more implicit level, I would say. So for example, the Europe's diversity, openness and tolerance that was so much prominent in the discourses of my participants, it was most often explained in terms of the coexistence of multiple national cultures, languages, and cuisines, as well as in terms of Europe's allegedly exceptional progress regarding gender and sexual liberation. But multiplicity of races, ethnicities, or religions, in turn, has hardly ever been mentioned by my participant as a kind of European characteristics. All those kind of multiplicity of races, ethnicities, or religions were never um, given as kind of example for how diverse, how open or tolerant Europe is. That's why to conclude, I think that with the growth of uh, authoritarianisms in Europe accompanied by intensified racism, xenophobia and Islamophobia, it remains crucial to research what forms European transnationalism takes and where the limits of the allegedly uniquely European qualities of diversity, openness, and tolerance are drawn, particularly at the intersection of gender and sexuality on the one hand and race, ethnicity, and religion on the other hand. And now bring that closer to my, to the concept that I kind of propose in that paper, if we think about uncanny Europe, then I think we should also think what makes Europe uncanny for whom and with what effects. And if Europeanness can work as a protective identificatory alternative to some national identities, who is it protecting from what and under what conditions? Thank you very much uh, for uh, listening to my talk. Thank you uh, to all three panelists. And I'm really pleased that we had at least one mention of Eurovision today. That's very important. <laughs> Uh, so I'm going to go ahead and um, we've got one question so far, and that's specifically for you. Did you, I don't know if folks have already, uh, please go ahead and start asking questions. Evren, for you, we have a question. Um, how can we understand the increase in gender-based violence in today's Turkey in light of your research? Uh, do you think we can draw parallels between soaring levels of gender-based violence and growing authoritarian populism and uh, neoliberal Islam? Uh, quite, yeah. Yeah, um, thank you for that question. So um, I'm also going to, uh, Jamie, take the liberty to remind our audience to turn on their cameras if they feel comfortable while they're asking questions and chatting with us. Um, so 
I, I do. I think, um, you know, it's uh, one concept I find really interesting and useful um, about this is what uh, Denis Candioti calls masculinist restoration. And she proposed um, that recently as an alternative to patriarchy, which as a concept has been critiqued uh, pretty um, significantly. And I do think that there is um, the increase in gender-based violence, I think is, is um, an expression of kind of a particular masculinist restoration. And I think it's also important here to remember um, Dibiesh's comments about the um, kind of heteronormative masculinist uh, basis of most nationalisms even post-colonial nationalisms, alternative nationalisms, and that this has been also critiqued by, or like underlined by scholars like, um, you know, Jackie Alexander, um, and also Rod Ferguson about black nationalism. So, um, so yes, I do, I do see it. And I do think that there is also like an unfortunate direct um, correlation in the sense that the Erdogan regime has been targeting feminists um, and, Kind of disobedient female subjects very explicitly um and and hailing a particular targeting of them so so i guess the short answer is yes and while we're waiting for other questions to come in i was wondering if each of you um maybe from the last panelist who spoke to the first could reflect on the the role of different geopolitical scales and thinking about these ideas of queer and conflict, or maybe something that you're percolating on now after hearing the three presentations. Um, I, I'd be curious if um, if anyone could could reflect on that. Yeah, sure. So in, in my work, as you could see, as I said in the presentation, I focused first on the national identity. I was kind of mostly interested in that in the context of migration, but still it was framed within quite um, national uh, within the national frames, it was a Polish LGBTQs in the UK rather than just queer migrants in the UK in general, for example. Uh, so then, um, yeah, I think it's very difficult because we don't want to limit ourselves to those national frames. But then, of course, it's it's difficult. It's like with intersectionality, we can focus on all different intersections, uh, and we, it's kind of sometimes difficult to focus on different geopolitical scales. So where do we start? I think it's useful to always start with some, with some particular point and then see um, where that takes you. So in being kind of uh, sensitive to what's going on actually in the data. And as I said, European identity was not really something that I looked in. It was not in my guidebook originally. And then people start mentioning it. So I try to pay attention to that and see, okay, so how does it, fit into the discussions with feeling, for example, Polish, but also some, for some participants, Scotland was an important uh, frame. For some other people were Silesia, uh, which is a region in Poland, that they feel, felt like very much identifying with that particular region. And also the idea of cosmopolitan, cosmopolitanism, also as a kind of particular identifications in terms of, of kind of geopolitical um, uh, ideas, yeah. So for me, I try to kind of pay, I think it's useful to have a starting point and then paying attention to actually what's coming from the data in terms of different geopolitical scales. Um, I too have a, an answer, but Dibyesh, would you like to go first? Uh, okay, I'll just be very quick. So for me, I mean, oh, yeah, uh, for me again, it depends upon what we are looking at, isn't it? So for me, it's quite important to focus on for me, I focus on the state level because maximum violence in the world takes place in the name of the state and by the state. So even when we have the international actors, the so-called international, the so-called international community, the reality is much of the violence and discrimination takes place in the name of the state or by the state. Therefore, for me, the focus is largely on that, but that should not stop us therefore from seeing that as more important than the others. It will depend upon whatever our agendas are and whatever level we want to focus on, but recognize that these levels matter and they interplay with each other. So what happens within the society is connected to what happens in the name of the society, the state level, what happens internationally. But one thing I would see in this happening already is the ways in which the international was largely appropriated by the Western countries that somehow they represent the international and they are the international community. And even the Western NGOs saw themselves international. I think that era is passing. 
and today for instance when we would talk, take example the you know the concentration camps in which uyghurs are put in xinjiang in east turkestan in china we do know that we say okay it is an international condemnation there is international sanction but not really it's minority of the countries including us uk and others who are talking about uyghurs to an extent not even fully most of the countries including almost all muslim majority countries are not only being silent but they actively siding with china so when we therefore we talk about the international and we have to be very careful to what extent in our context we look at there being some kind of international broadly international consensus on what the progress is i think there's a wider struggle going um yeah thank you jamie i think that i um so i have a few thoughts but i'll try to be concise i think of scales as um in some ways useful analytics but in other ways sometimes kind of uh, potentially distracting i mean i think we need to remember that there analytics for some formal so like the world in the world the national and the transnational does not exist separately um i think in our analysis we can kind of maybe talk about a separation as long as it's useful so in my case um the national is never separate from the transnational and um and i hope that maybe came across a little bit in the talk because to me you know one of the one of the things i problematize in the book for instance is the positioning of islam like an ominous kind of um symbolic islam as an alternative to western modernity in a lot of analyses and um and i find that deeply problematic and really disregarding the very transnational histories of a production of a particularly de-radicalized islam in the middle east um um politically and economically honestly so um so for me these um but but i i do still think that since a lot of scholarship has been set up with those scales it has been important for me while thinking about neoliberalism to think um clearly about how much did then this is something many scholars have done how much did global capitalism erase those national borders and how much it didn't and in fact what it did do to some national borders that it didn't do to other national borders like some some powers consolidated other others were affected differently so i think they're analytically useful and like for me there the regional is also important because the kurdish issue clearly um emerges but but it's also transnational regional because there's the north of iraq and syria so it's i think that the nation state is this you know pretty uh shitty you know container that kind of falls apart at every corner when we and i'll analyze it I have to say I love how we're keeping it absolutely complicated and complex which I think is <laughs> makes a lot of sense. I also want to say thank you to Judith who has relayed a YouTube question for us here. So thanks everyone who's got their uh video on and we have a question for Lukash here. Uh, uh in the UK we've seen a very distinctive and frightening attempt uh to separate LGBT and trans identities as part of a transphobic attempt to combat gender ideology. Um I believe there's something similar happening in Poland. How much do you notice differentiation within LGBT identity among your respondents? Yes, that's a great uh, question. So, first of all, I think I cannot actually answer that question in detail because I had a very diverse sample. Sometimes I call it super diverse. I was just overwhelmed that like 700 something people actually replied to my survey for such a niche group Polish LGBTQs in the UK and then more than 300 people said that they would like to be interviewed by me and I thought that because it's like one of the first large scale studies of that group I decided to go for the diversity which has advantages and disadvantages so I have a different voices now of different people ac across the spectrum of LGBTQ different ages uh living in different parts in the UK uh but of course then it's really bit difficult for me to say that this group uh i can compare, compare for example younger uh, lgbtqs to older or lesbians to gay men that makes it a little bit difficult for me to answer that but i can answer that question a little bit differently in a sense of this kind of oppositions to um to to trans rights within um uh, in the UK I think that's a very interesting question because um so yes in the UK we we observed this kind of the rise of the so-called gender critical discourse uh, especially among some uh, trans exclusive uh, radical feminists uh that are clinging to this idea of 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 um, particular biological sex understood in a very limited way 
Uh, and in Poland, it's actually not that much prominent, uh, that discourse particularly. Uh, so I think that's already interesting in itself because it subverts those idea that the centrist in Europe catching up with the West, hopefully will not catch up with that in that respect. Um, and traditionally in Poland or historically, feminist movement is actually quite much in support of LGBTQ um, uh, groups. What we do observe, it is similar discourse, is the discourse of gender ideology, which is also like the gender critical discourse in the UK, also is based on the same premise of like, we have to cling to this idea of biological sex, but it's coming not from the kind of radical feminists and the uh, um, groups, but it's actually coming from the right wing groups. So I think there's a very interesting kind of parallels there, but actually also the differences. Uh, and it would be interesting to actually how it kind of functions transnationally in the future. Um, did anyone, I guess two questions, did either uh, speaker want to respond to that or do you have questions for other panelists? I wanted to open it up to that before I pose another question because we don't have any other questions in yet. So do, did any of the panelists want to ask a question of someone else? I was thinking of bringing something up that kind of connects us also to the um, to the panel to the keynote yesterday. Since I see Rahul here with us too, maybe we can ask him to jump in as well. Like, so I thought that uh, one of the um, or some of the points that Diviesh made about um, the ways in which today um, it seems like cultural difference is evoked um, to claim a certain kind of post-colonial sovereignty um, and. And you know, in the case of Turkey, it's a little bit complicated because there it is not a post-colonial location exactly. It's in fact a post-imperial um, location with the really current imperial um, aspirations, I think. But um, but I I do think that there is a particular ways in which uh, cultural difference uh, seems to be evoked today in arguments that can be deeply conservative, but that are some bizarre. Like they have some bizarre referentiality to, um, I'll borrow from Lukács, like uncanny post-colonial theory or something. I mean, there, there is something about the, and Erdogan does this all the time too. He will evoke the, you know, like lack of um, respect for, you know, um, like European neo-imperialism and neo-colonialism whenever it suits him to restore Turkish kind of um, culture and honor as superior. Um, to to kind of garner his, and I, I think that this has resonances with Rahul's work a little bit as well, like on the time, I mean, part of it is from the talk yesterday, but part of it is from the book also. So I think, um, I think there are some, I mean, it's not fully a question, but maybe an invitation to comment or conversation from anyone who wants to. I think this is a particular moment when we're seeing almost like a particular um, post-colonial theoretical kind of pushback holding in on itself or something like it's it's acquiring I mean it's it, you know there are unexpected consequences to everything but there is a very like perverse re um, use or um, repurposing of some of these arguments by quite like right-wing authoritarian regimes but can I just add to that and then others can speak is you're right Erin I mean the, what we find is I mean the whole critique of post-colonial theory and other things that's going on. Then you have got figures like Erdogan, Modi, and Xi Jinping, of course, is much more expert than any of them when it comes to being authoritarian. Though most of the time we don't talk of him when we talk of uh, populist authoritarians, right? Although he's the archetypical authoritarian figure. In all of them, in a way, they're very good at using the language of the hurt, the wound, that we should not be challenged. We are finally becoming a strong country. You are questioning us. They're there for the external enemy and largely about the, now it's about the Western NGOs, Western human rights activists, Western media, Western government. But of course, they're the internal enemies. In this case, the Kurds, once HDP, which is progressive, will become seen as the enemy. And there's always a portrayal of the enemy as sometimes effeminate, sometimes trying to subvert our heterosexist masculinity. So sexuality is at the very heart of it. So what they have managed to do, of course, is portray the idea of them creating the authentic native self with, with the others. I'm sure they have not, I assume they have not read uh, Gatsby Spivak or even maybe, you know, Edward Syed or anyone else. They may not have read it. But when you look at the advisors that these governments often have, 
we shouldn't be surprised that they do read. They do use an appropriate, very selectively, what others have said. They use something from Fanon, they'll use something from Césaire, but only something and not the other thing, right? So what they have done, of course, is that's, now my question is for us as, let's say, scholars, largely based in the West, when we critique homo national, homo capitalism, to what extent are we also able to sort of look at the ways in which that critique directly, indirectly, consciously, unconsciously can be appropriated by those who are very queer phobic in any case and will use all the ideas to uh, sort of uh, reinforce queer phobia, queer phobic nationalism. That's a question. Yeah, and I'll add very quickly, for instance, in the case of Erdogan, like he's critiquing, he often uh, addresses kind of in a rhetorical way the IMF uh, often, occasionally the World Bank or like international credit rating companies, all of which need our critique, right? Like, I mean, it's just a very interesting kind of turn of events that it, there's nothing technically wrong about critiquing IMF or international credit rating companies, but the, to what it serves ultimately, to what it is made to serve is um, super deeply right wing. Um, authoritarian politics. So we've got a couple of other questions coming in, a couple towards uh, you, Evren, again. So I'm wondering, um, one is that you talked about the messy relationship between neoliberalism and Islam in the context of Turkey. How do you interpret Erdogan's recent claim that there is no LGBT in relation to the state's neoliberal Islamic projects. And I wonder if along with that, you can reflect a bit, or if this fits with reflecting on this or not, but thinking about how you can critique the neoliberal Islam without giving support to Islamophobes, right? Um, yeah, I think that, thank you, um, Jamie. So, um, so to the question, thank you, Mark, for this question. Um, I, I find this shift very interesting. It's so recent, like I feel like it's been five minutes since the government rhetoric shifted from, um, you know, LGBT people are kind of problematic with internal elements of this country and we will deal with them accordingly to, um, they don't exist. They don't exist as it's, it's like two weeks old. So I haven't had that much time to reflect on what this shift means, but I do think that um, it's not just this, but like many of the things that I have recounted are showing a real um, fall from power of the government. I mean, they have their, the polls are showing that they're also, you know, literally um, losing some of their voter base. Um, they already don't have the parliamentary majority without their coalition partners. So it's like, that's a relationship they have. And the coalition partner is the ultra-nationalist party. So they absolutely need to cater to them. And if that falls apart, they have, you know. So um, so there is, a, there are a lot of things that are kind of falling apart. So in that sense, I'm not finding it terribly surprising that the government is upping, I think, the um, kind of severity or radicalness of the discourse of othering, right? So so we have seen something between 2000 and like, you know, five age to 2021, let's say we've seen from like literally a shift from neoliberal incorporation to um, uh, almost of even almost of queers, but definitely of ethnic and religious minorities to a real um, objection of, of most minorities currently. Um, so, so I think that queers are not being that node that look like that seem really useful to the morality project of neoliberalism. So like, it seems like anyone can garner around, you know, being homophobic it's an easy bait and i i think this this is also quite telling because as the turkish government uh, amongst protests really um withdrew from the istanbul convention they cited that they said you know we have no problem with protecting women against violence and domestic violence we're worried what this convention says about supporting lgbti plus people so now they're trying to cleave you know feminists from queers which is a really, really deep and I think fairly solid solidarity. And there are lots of also, I think, you know, like people overlap, like they're both in both of these movements. Um, I think it's a very interesting move to really like kind of separate queers from any other coalition partner they might have. So so I think, and, and I don't know, there's really very little, I mean, you know, the government has been complaining that they haven't figured out how to have um, they seriously have said this cultural hegemony in the country cultural and social hegemony they have political hegemony ish but they don't have it culturally so i think this is their 
their move. Um, I don't think it's a very good bet, but but I think that's what's going on. And uh, Jamie, you asked. Um, I think okay, I remember. So so I I mean I think that people are doing it in Turkey. There are there are lots of you know there there are lots of pious Muslims um, who were also quite active in the kind of movement to get the like you know headscarf opening passed because headscarf wearing was banished basically from public institutions and public universities until the AKP regime. And now people are really not folding, trying very hard not to fall back into this like secular versus religious divide that um, this government um, found its sort of strength from and positioned itself kind of uh, not as opposed to, but they, they basically have had this re return of the repressed moment. So I think now people are really trying very hard not to create, reproduce these binaries and not to create new repress, not to have a backlash, in other words, against Islam at large or Muslims in general, but just to really rely on the multiple voices that are emerging, that are debating the definitions of Islam as um you know, propagated by the government. And I think that is the way to go. I think it's really to multiply the meanings and um, positions and not let uh, the government monopolize them and solidify them and unify them. Thank you for that response. And I think that may be the last you'll be able to offer because I know that you may have to dip out. Um, although we have quite a few questions coming in, so we might try to run over a little bit. We'll see, I don't know, no promises. Um, so Dibish, can you tell us, this is quite, you you raised so many interesting questions, not to, to say nothing of the fact that you said homo communism. And that, I, I don't know about anyone else, but I was just like, tell me more about how you've been thinking about this. But we've got this, uh, you know, you, you mentioned that many scholars focus on the homo critique and almost forget about the nationalism. Could you, this is a question from Andrew, could you say a little more about that and what areas are critical scholars focusing on that might be unproductive or as you said, potentially be co-opted by queer phobic groups? Okay, thanks again. And as I, I know, the way I speak is sort of not always uh, clear whether I'm critiquing a person or critiquing the reception of that person. So, for instance, when I look at uh, Jaspir Puar's work or Rahul Rao's work, for me, that's not the problem. The problem, the way in which they are very easily and casually used by many of us, I include myself in that, by the way, right? Many of us that, oh, yeah, homo nationalism read Puar. Now, homo capitalism, homo nationalism read uh, Rahul Rao. And then we very casually only focus on the limits of the queer politics. I said, which is fine, I mean, it's important. But sometimes I do think that why is there so much of self reflection, which is fine? I also do it, by the way. But why is there an almost an obsessive self reflection questioning ourselves and our own limits? without recognizing that we are still very small minority, we are still not hegemonic, we are far, far from being hegemonic, not hegemonic, we are far from having any power in real sense in most parts of the world. So there are people who are erased. And so the fact that, so for me, therefore, the, the way I would say is, the reason why even poor or even Rahul and others who are focused on homonational is because the ways in which queer, but parts of queer identity is being misused for nationalist purpose. So the critique is actually of nationalism. And the ways in which, that's my understanding, the, and the ways in which certain branches of queer politics is being weaponized for that purpose. But the use of their work is largely around critique of queer politics rather than critique of nationalism. Because if we accept that it's essentially a critique of nationalism, then we should also look at other forms of resistant nationalism. So for instance, when we challenge, and let me give you, uh, Islamophobia, are we also talking of, for instance, are we also talking of queer phobia amongst Muslim minorities, some Muslim, not all, but some Muslim minorities in the UK? Are we only talking of, let's say, Islamophobia among some LGBTQ in the UK? And my reading of the queer scholarly landscape as well as queer social media landscape is there's almost a, not a veneration, but almost a silence around certain sacred cows, certain things you don't challenge because, of course, Islamophobia is bad there. We should not be even raising questions around queer Muslims. We should simply focus on how queer politics is not radical enough, not inclusive enough, right? What I was therefore saying is let's look at all those things, so the ways in which we ourselves defeat ourselves. And one final thing, because I know we'll be running out of time, is uh, what someone talked about with the way, let's say, the trans identity and gender identity and the ways in which this whole attempt to put one against the other. And again, Twitter is a good example where almost always you think that that's the only issue that matters. My fear is, and this is what I would like to say to gender critical feminists in particular, that I mean, being appropriated by 
largely right wing and sometimes left wing how they put it the straight bros straight brothers right i mean i will use that straight bros is dangerous the fact that the telegraph has started to has started being the defender of certain forms of femininity should raise questions about the ways in which our politics can be used finally colonialism coloniality is about divide and rule divide and rule divide and rule divide and rule right and that's what i fear around queer identity and queer politics that we are being divided and ruled beat around gender sexuality lines and my fear is that largely the progress that have been made in terms of even some of us being visible can be eroded quite quickly unless we are very watchful and we recognize that our visibility and rights here is connected to our visibility and rights elsewhere and no for me it's quite clear that no form of resistance politics that does not also recognize the need to challenge queer phobia is a fully legitimate resistance politics the way in which no queer politics is legitimate until and unless it also challenges other forms of injustices and exclusions that's my concluding remark uh there's one more question for lukash and allow it to also allow him to have some final thoughts here and then we'll wrap up the panel but um based on your previous work on communism and gay people in poland do you think the communist past has an impact on the current homophobia in poland and the search for support in the eu by polish people does this come up in your research mm -hmm. thanks a lot um, so of course it does because i think every past has an importance on the present so it's kind of um, maybe not in a direct way, but it definitely, uh, you know, first of all, in the discourses that I was talking about, like the Europe, Eastern Europe, uh, imagine as lagging behind the, uh, the West is because of the state socialism and communist past, which is very often imagined as like, I, I wrote in my book on transnational homosexuals in communist Poland, it's very often imagined as a kind of waste time, that nothing happened, no LGBTQ movement was there. When I was showing actually that book that people already were organizing themselves, publishing their magazines and so on. Uh, on the other hand, it's also because it strengthened the position of the Pol uh, Roman Catholic Church in Poland that was seen as kind of helping the opposition to, to win, um, uh, to, to fight the communism. So in that sense as well. But in my interviews, uh, some of the participants, not many of them, but some of them actually mentioned that. And they were also saying, yes, because of this kind of communist path, we are lagging behind. Uh, so we now have to catch up. So they were actually buying or not by like reappropriating the same narrative of catching up in transition and so on. Some of them were a little bit more ambivalent about it. They were saying, well, you know, um, uh, there were some uh, important feminist um, achievements in communism, though we know that, that, of course, that's kind of also not that straightforward. There was kind of double burden on, on women that had to go to work at the same time, take care of the house as well. Uh, but it's very often imagined that, that, that communism was somewhat more progressive in terms of <clears throat> emancipation of women. So some of my participants were building on those imaginations um, as well. Um, yeah, so to, to that extent, they did it. They, they sometimes employ it. The one final thing I want to say to maybe the previous questions about the appropriation, uh, because I think it's a lot of discussions about what we do when we actually want to critique something and then our critique is being used against us. Uh, what also Dibiesz was mentioning, also us scholars based in West commenting then on situations, for example, in my case, of queerness in Poland, while one of the discourse is that, uh, uh, that LGBTQ isn't kind of ideology coming from the West and being, being Westernized. I think that one kind of potential way to deal with that is, uh, well, first of all, I sometimes I try to ignore it a little bit because I think people can appropriate whatever they want and whatever we, we whatever, whatever we do, they can still may find a way to reappropriate it and, and show that we are doing something uh, in a different way that we actually meant that. Uh, but the other thing is, I think is those, all those things that we are discussing about is very often at the level of very abstract ideas. It's about national identity as some kind of abstract, LGBTQ ideology, gender ideology, uh, Islam, as everyone was talking, also imagine as a kind of one big thing. So I think maybe one way to, to go against that is to focus on people, on stories, 
not ideology, but people, and not discourses, big discourses, but stories, everyday people's stories. And, and kind of, I remember when in Poland, the president was talking about like LGBTQ are not people, their ideology. Then on Twitter, a lot of LGBTQ people started the hashtag Jestem LGBT, which means I am LGBT. And that was quite powerful. That was like thousands of thousands of people posting their everyday life, their selfies, saying I am LGBTQ, LGBTQ. It's not ideology. So I think maybe that's also power of our academics when we are usually uh, encouraged to write in big abstract, thinking about theories and concepts. Maybe we should maybe go a little bit more, if we want to be more political, maybe we should also go a little bit more in the journalism way and thinking about stories and people. I love that <laughs> as a conclusion to our panel. And I also think that this conference very much has that in mind. I think that you'll find that the other panels and the workshops that are part of this conference very much are about um, recognizing, you know, moving beyond uh, theory and ideology and also grounding this and thinking about the people and the people doing this work, right? So I want to thank all the speakers as well as everyone attending. Um, we've got many fantastic questions continuing to roll in. We'll be sure to uh, make sure that um, the questions get to the different panelists if we weren't able to answer them. And please do check out the uh, details of future seminars and events, which I was just mentioning on the crash.cam.ac.uk website. Maybe we can drop that in the chat box because I don't think that's translating with me just saying this. Um, and thank you to the conference organizers. This has been really fantastic. And I'll just hand it over to you in case you wanted to say anything to, to go ahead and end this panel. <laughs> so thank you very much the speakers, the chair, and, and everyone who's been able to join. <laughs>